You're listening to Product-Led Revenue, brought to you by Correlated. In each episode, you'll hear first-hand advice and tactics from SaaS sales and revenue leaders about using product signals to drive expansion and revenue growth. Let's jump in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Product-Led Revenue. I'm Breezy Beaumont, and this episode is brought to you by Correlated, a customer expansion platform for B2B software companies that focus on product-led growth. Today, our guest is Stefan Hedebrandt. Co-founder and Re- Chief Revenue Officer at Dream Data, Stefan. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for the uh, the invite, Breezy. The, this is definitely a topic that is very much on my and uh, our whole company's mind at the moment. Awesome. Okay, so to give our audience some background on yourself, can you tell us about your role at Dream Data? Yes, so you can say I'm a, I'm a B2B marketing leader turned uh, CRO, uh, which comes with uh, a lot of good stuff and uh, <laughs> a lot of challenges of learning uh, how to do like, I don't know, mid-size SaaS uh, deals, which I, you know, it was easy back when I just had to ship over the, the demo calls and then have somebody else close them. But now I have to understand both things and, you know, there's a lot of learnings in that and uh, yeah that's where i am today cool and for anyone who's listening to this podcast that maybe isn't super familiar with dream data yet do you mind just giving a little bit of background on what the problem is that you all are solving yes uh, really happy to so so we do uh, B2B revenue attribution. And what we mean by that is whether we're trying to, to help companies understand what's happening when one B2B company is purchasing another or is purchasing a product from another company. And the, the, the fairly more technical way of describing this is that we're a data platform that connects to every uh, resource that touches your account journeys. So that being your CRM, your marketing automation software, your CS software, outreach software, the tracking data you have on your website and so forth. We we pull all of that over into a Google BigQuery, clean it up and join it, and then organize it into a nice data model that contains every touch of every account that you deal with. Very cool. And, and Dream Data yeah, didn't and then, always uh, have this self-service offering that you guys have today. So <laughs> what did uh, what did that look like before before the transition when you were more of a sales-led company? What, what, what did it look like then? And yeah, so, so, transition been like? so we, yeah, this is something we've done uh, this year. And it's I think product-led has always been something we wanted to do, but our tech was just not ready for it. So we had to kind of do custom stuff for every customer until we got to a point of time where the data was standardized enough to actually offering a free tier. And then you could like let everybody create an account and we'll sync the data and sort the data and clean it up and so forth. Uh, so up until uh, this spring, we, we were kind of like push traffic to the website, get people to book demo calls with us and then trust us it's gonna work. <laughs> and then, you know, that user kind of sales led approach to it, uh, which um, when you're in an industry uh, like we are, uh, a B2B attribution or whatever what you want to call it, we quite often went up ahead uh, against the Abyssable, which is like kind of a Marketo owned company, which again is owned by Adobe. So, like, very enterprise and glowing references that they can pull off, in our opinion tech is getting a bit old it's not scalable it's not smart anymore but anyway we were losing deals to these guys even though we we felt we had the better product uh and that just led us to kind of can we just get to a place where we can show people that our product works instead of you having to promise that it's gonna work uh, (laughs) not being able to pull on engineering resources to give proof that it works and then we kind of just decide okay Let's just do it now because we feel that we've standardized enough. Uh, like examples could be like we connect to eight different CRM systems now, and like there's the Salesforce, there's the HubSpot, there's Close IO, Microsoft Dynamics, and each of them calls, for example, a deal created a different things, or a deal one is called different things. Maybe it's an opportunity one in some system. It's deal creation in, in our system. So 
before we had all that in place, we couldn't really uh, tear off the bandaid to to to, to go product led. But now that we got there, uh, we we kind of opened the door now, and uh, yeah, completely changed how we we sell our product. Yes, I mean, I have to imagine that was a a pretty huge change internally. You know, so what was that? What was that? process like to to make that first swap you know i read your post about just add a button <laughs> it was one of the quotes that was in there so what was the what yeah. was that like internally to be at a company who made making that shift so i think there's there's two sides to it there's the one there's the, the product implementation or like going live with technical changes and then there's the uh, you know almost change management or like changing habits of your sales people so if we start with the product side of it, it's uh, my two co-founders are like really big uh, Marty Kagan fans and like don't build before you can prove value kind of uh, thinkers. And so what we basically did was just like go to our pricing page, uh, add a column to the left of the current <laughs> pricing that said free, submit an email if you're interested in free. And then like, okay, an email came through, when then like manually created an account, manually shipped an email and then manually help people on board. But it was just to kind of prove that the demand was there. And after the first month or two, we could see like, oh, we're, this is becoming annoying because we're too slow at doing these things to keep up with the demand, which is nice. That's what like you would phrase as a positive pain, but still a pain because shit, I'm an hour late with sending this invite. So like, when you feel that positive pain, it's kind of you identify stuff that you can make more scalable, like let's automate the invite of the email that you send out or let's automate different parts of the processes. So we did it very like uh, manually in the beginning to not spend any resources at all on stuff before we had proof. So if, and then if we then jump to kind of the more, the people side of it, uh, I think we, I think we have to admit we dropped the ball pretty heavily in April because I think that it's, we went from having 100% demo calls to having somewhere around a third demo calls and two thirds uh, free signups in our product. The The quality of the traffic didn't go, uh, the, the conversions didn't go down. It was just very obvious to us that people prefer to buy software in a, in a different way than having to be forced to talk to a salesperson. And now suddenly two thirds of all the accounts or leads were coming in to a free product that kind of basically had no experience at all in the beginning. You know, it has now, but we again deliberately didn't want to enforce any particular tour before we had more data to prove what's the right path. But it's been a big learning experience for our salespersons going out of the loop of kind of uh, a demo call, then committing to a discovery call, then committing to like a personalized demo and so forth. Now people, well, our salespeople, first of all, they spend their time trying to detect who of the signups looks like our ICPs because we have too much demand now, which is positive. So it's about like selecting who of the accounts actually looks like somebody who we could sell to who could become a happy customer and then you're actually convincing them that they're also in the sales process <laughs> because the, the, the tax is free, uh, says free initially. So you actually have to like come to this path. This is the buying path. Uh, so there's been a lot of learning for the salespeople and you transition more to kind of a hybrid salesperson or like a hybrid between CS and sales because it's about utilizing the product to prove that it, like, you should buy it more than it's fancy slides, making a business case, convincing buyer groups, etc. Does that make, uh, make sense? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it, it must have been a huge swap for your sales team, right? And so what are some of the things that 
and, and a positive swap, right? Because there's more business to be had, but it, it just changes their role. And I think one of the ways that I've heard others phrasing this is like this idea of consultative sales, um, where, you know, sales is having a little bit more of a customer success role. And, and I think some ways vice versa for customer success teams, especially when they're like owning an expansion quota. But what was that? What are some of the shifts that your your sales team took or, or you took to help train the sales team um, so that they could be successful as as their roles kind of change to this more consultative piece rather than selling something behind a closed door? So it's definitely increased the need to to collab with our customer success team, because now the reps needs to make sure that you know, data gets connected, uh, that it works, uh, that the data starts flowing into the kind of the data model so they can have conversations about how the data looks. Uh, whereas opposed to before, they just had to get the deal signed and then they could forget about it. Uh, and it's like even bit, it's been even been introducing them to like a tool like Retool so they could actually go into the into Retool and do some internal tooling on every account, which is, you know, for some salespeople, that's highly technical, but it's actually not that hard if you just give them an uh, an introduction. Uh, and then I think it's it's been about really helping them focus their attention on you know you know your ideal customer profiles. It's these guys you need to get into conversations with, and the rest of them don't spend time on on, on those eighty percent. That's not really ICP because that's not gonna we're not gonna sell to them or they're not going to be happy customers if they if they sign up to the product. So we've, we've done a lot of uh, internal dashboarding around who's signing up to free and who's looking attractive to help the salespeople spend their time better. So for example, we, we have like five technical points that would kind of uh, condense the kind of uh, now you're technically onboarded to our product. So we have like a green and red light there. Have they become onboarded? How much data do they now uh, have in the platform? Are they exceeding the limits of our like free tiers? Uh, we can like we can also it's a little bit having cheat codes for the computer game, but we can also see how much money are they spending on ads, which says a lot about their needs for like an attribution solution as well. So, and then yeah, obviously also monitoring are people logging into the product? Are there, how many sessions do they have within the product? So. It's been a lot about just helping the salespeople actually see who is uh, who's hand raising from product usage in, in, in some way. Um, that's been some of the big things, uh, I would say. Yeah, it makes sense. And can you can you walk me through? I think you know maybe this is backing up a little bit, but what's the process like for the end user when they click that? get dream data free button on your site and and what's that look like once they are starting to go through um, that process is there have you put limitations into the product that um, people are able to get for free some people put I know like feature limitations or usage limitations or what does that look like for you guys so that's a really good question. And like we set out deliberately not to put limitations uh, initially. So essentially free gives you access to the full product. Uh, so we wanted to like just open doors, see what happened when they get inside. Now we can start to kind of sense things that make sense to shut down. Like if you have a huge ton of data and you don't reply our emails and we you know we pay our cloud bill to process this data every day then we'll, we have an option within retool to kind of downgrade don't do that thing every day um but initially it's, we kind of kept the doors open so what you do today you go to like our sign up form press uh, submit then you get a mail saying now you can go here and create your account and then when you get into into dream data uh, you basically go to, to data sources and connect all the sources that you want to have part of your data model, which typically is CRM, automation, CS, and then install our script on your website so we track anonymous visitors and we look at form submissions. And then the last component would typically be all the ad platforms that you use. 
And then within uh, 24 hours, our uh, algorithms have uh, sorted and cleaned the data. And you will be able to see the first kind of draft of what we were able to pull out of your HubSpot or your Salesforce. And then kind of now kind of the time comes where when that happens, our salespeople needs to kind of now you need to connect with those people to to get into a dialogue to, to, to see is there, if there's a potential sale there or not. And then as a sidetrack, obviously, we're doing some more and more stuff that enables people to, to self-serve. As I said, like there's five components to what we define as being on board. And we, now we're making sure that people can actually see that those five things, that they've done those things, like have you connected your CRM? Have you installed our script, et cetera? But the whole point is that we want to like getting very close to people or empowering people to self-serve as, as, as much as possible. It's also like making sure that there's a great intro video so that explains them what to do and so forth. So there's a, the, the, again, there's the product path and then there's the salespeople path in, in making this, uh, this is a success. And, and what tools is your sales team using um, to, to look at this data and understand how the best way to reach out to people based on, you know, some of those ICP factors that you talked about, but also about how they're actually using your product. So with now just, we've just, right, we use HubSpot as a CRM now, and we actually, we've used, uh, you know, we're using our, yeah, HubSpot as our CRM, and then we've connected uh, high touch to our own data model. And now we can see inside of HubSpot, who's logging into the product, how many sessions do they have? We've created a lead score within HubSpot again uh, to, to see kind of who should we spend our attention on. Then we've also made some uh, reports using a tool that's called Cluvio that gives them an overview of every account in the product. Uh, so I think what the most two most, I think it's kind of that HubSpot dashboard and that Cluvio dashboards are the ones that our salespeople use the most. And then there's the tangible, like day-to-day -day stuff, attractive account, account signs up, hurry up and go into LinkedIn and connect with them. When they've con with, when you've connected on LinkedIn, you might also send an introductory email and then like you're trying to hope to kind of pick up a dialogue in, in one of those medias and at best get on a call with them. It's very clear that like some people are like, don't disturb me before I can see that your product actually works. <laughs> and then like 50 sessions down, they want to talk to sales, but not before that they can actually see that it works. And I think that it's been one of the big revelations is that you need to like, people don't want to talk to sales before they can see that stuff works nowadays. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. I actually saw, I was reading through a Gartner uh, study that came out recently about the percentage of people who would rather just go through a, their own sales process without sales ever getting involved. Um, and it just, as you would probably imagine, increases with each generation, like it jumped by like 10% or something like that for each generation going up. I'll have to pull that, pull that into yeah. the show notes on this one. But um, it was an interesting, interesting that, report. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it meant maybe it's just a small like flavor to this as well. They kind of, we, we don't cap or you can have an unlimited amount of uses on our product which is, I think is super important. If you want a, an active product, you don't want a business model or a pricing model that caps amount of users inside of the product. I, at, yeah, at least in my book, that would kind of be not, not the right place to cap uh, usage. Yeah. Yeah. And one, th one other thing that I was thinking that you touched on that, that is interesting is, you know, you've, you've actually been able to pull a decent amount of your product data into HubSpot and your other dashboard as well so that your team can act on it. Are you also doing anything to notify your team about that data? Or are you able to track any changes in that data over time? Or is it more of a of a snapshot of, of what that looks like at, at the time that the, the salesperson goes in to look at it? So at, at the present time, it's just you know, it updates, uh, yeah, more than daily, I think six times a day or something like that. 
obviously when we are uh, like hopefully at 50 or 100 salespeople, we can shoot this information to them uh, automatically as well. There's a nice like, touch thing about our product is that actually inside of the Dream Data product, you can you can get a view of all the accounts that you own in the CRM system. And then you can sort by last seen activity. So if you just keep that in front of you, you can see, oh, this account that you owned came into the website or they downloaded an ebook or they added an integration or, or something like that. Oh yeah, and then we do have uh, some push to uh, to Slack channels with this account with by this user just added this integration. So kind of, oh, you get very excited when it says, oh, Salesforce added, then you know, we're in a good path here or a, a silent or ghosting account suddenly invites somebody to to the product then oh this is good <laughs> and it's the whole thing about selling product yeah, is that you get so many good. more things to uh, you get so many more signals than if you're only doing like the, the, yeah if you're only doing that sales led model yeah, definitely. I think one of the things is that you're you're starting to touch on there is the idea of like a, a product qualified lead. So in the past, if you're just using like a marketing or sales qualified lead without introducing additional product data, you're looking at, you know, things that they've downloaded on their website or how many times they're visiting your site or some of these other metrics, but a lot of companies are now also either piling into that or creating this sort of double funnel approach to also looking at product data in that process. So um, do you all have, are you using product qualified leads or PQLs in some format? So we're not, we're not counting, uh, counting at, in that sense yet, like, but we have all these tables with hundreds of accounts using the product and you can kind of sort them by biggest ad spent, most were visitors on the website, most logins to the product, most sessions, etc. So the reps, they can see the accounts that they own and they can sort them by those metrics. Uh, somewhere down the line, we can develop that into more like a lead scoring or product qualified lead uh, approach. But in essence, in, in practice, it's working like that already so yeah it was just kind of also like a typical demo call you'd also be kind of you'll always be like finger cr fingers crossed that the text that they'll bring to us would fit what we work well with <laughs> and then like oh fuck, we don't implement uh, this technology and then oh, that, we, need, we need to hang up now or you need to pay us like 10x of a normal order because we'll have to do anything custom now the product-led path tells us the whole tech stack before we need to talk to them and we can identify problems we know things we're good at and bad at and and, and so forth and you know competitive battle cards will also know uh, yeah, those guys don't integrate with send this excel but we do so like good luck finding a, an alternative to to our product it, but it yeah, in general just gives us so many insights to to who they are and what to say uh, to all the accounts that we, we speak to because the data is right there in, in front of us Yeah, makes sense. Um, I, what I was thinking too while you were while you were talking is like, there's some level to which I feel like you're doing a product qualified account, and even if that's not a scoring model, you're able to kind of sift through your accounts and see which of those are more qualified based on product actions and also some non like firmographic pieces about them or, or pieces of data that are interesting to you all, like people visiting their website or their ad spend or things like that. Um, so you know, I think it. I think it's on the same path as a lot of other uh, a lot of other companies that we've been speaking to as well. Um, one other one of the topics I wanted to sort of dig in with you on that I think really every single company struggles with <laughs> is pricing, um, the big P word. So. Um, <laughs> Everybody wants to hear about what other companies are doing for pricing. Everybody struggles with pricing. So can you walk me through what Dream Data is doing uh, on the pricing side? Yes, uh, I can try to. Um, so yeah, as you say, it's definitely not something we, we feel like we've 100% nailed yet. We, we need more experience in the data. But we kind of, today we have three tiers. 
there's free and then we just call them team and business free you can only have at most you can have 5000 unique visitors on your website a month if you are just data so that's the very small uh, companies who fits there if you pass above the the 5000 limits that's essentially when you know the, the sales pe people get an, an order to go these people you should start having conversations with then we have uh, we have two uh, we have the team tier which for us means self service and then we have the business tier which means we can help the customers make the data work in the team uh, tier uh, the data models needs to be able to sort the data automatically uh, and then in business which 90 percent of our customers are in we can actually afford to uh, to have our engineers help people out and then so we at the end of the day we price on two components amounts of data we need to process on behalf of the customer and then the technology that they use so the more standardized the cheaper we are and the more complex <laughs> the more expensive we get so like a, a simple explanation could be hubspot super highly standardized crm uh, microsoft dynamics very customizable and very like nitty gritty and like you have to spend a lot of time to make the data, data model work with that so the price goes up the same thing with just the amount of data we need to to handle because our data data model needs to process the data and then, then that would price on so you can like so as you can hear it's not super sophisticated yet um something that would be interesting to do in the future would be uh performance based in in some way uh, so this is just me brainstorming <laughs> and not something's happening short term but we can prove to people how much better their ad spend becomes by using dream data for example so say you're spending a hundred thousand dollars in ads a month we can prove like you can do like a benchmark saying that 80 percent of all your ad campaigns is not bringing you any sales qualified leads right now after you started using dream data now you're only wasting 50 percent of your ad budget but that's kind of just some some very loose ideas about where we could go in the future right now it's just complexity of the data volume of the data that we we price upon yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense it's interesting to think of it um that as a potential future model because it's sort of a win-win for you and the customer. It, you know, I, I don't know if you're gonna like this uh, relation, but it kind of reminds me of those people who will call on behalf of you and, and get your your uh, like Comcast or other bills down for you and they'll fight the bill. To then whatever amount that they got <laughs> your bills down for you, they take, you know, percentage cut of that. <laughs> it sort of reminds me of that a little bit. But it makes sense because it's like you know it's a it's a win-win. So if you're helping your customers to to you know better focus their ad spend and taking a cut of that, I think that could make yeah. a lot of sense. The more uh, the win-win, the more the pay us when we perform, the better we'll feel. Basically, like we don't want to like overcharge customers if we're not performing. So like it would be super cool to be paid by the improvements we bring. Yeah. Definitely. And I think one of the other parts that, that is sort of already built into your pricing on that is the, the potential usage on there. And so I don't know if if that's kind of like a usage based pricing that will increase over time or if you're sort of setting like, a you know, threshold benchmarks for potential usage and, and sort of pricing on that. But I think in some ways you already it sounds like you already have some of that, um, you know, whatever the, the usage and upside is going to be for the customer built into the pricing, which I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So right now we don't just, we only have that kind of organic increase in, in data, like from one year to another that we would increase the price a little bit upon. Uh, but yeah, just anecdotally, I would, would just down here that kind of, I just love when Slack sends you this message of uh, this, person didn't from your company didn't log in the last month so here's a refund of uh, five dollars or seven dollars kind of this very honest approach to kind of who you charge and not charge it's just uh, yeah that's just very admirable for uh, in my world yeah yeah it's a very very 
forward thinking, I think, but I, I do think that the market's sort of headed in that direction. Um, speaking of, of where things are headed, you know, we're, we're getting towards the end of this conversation, but one thing I wanted to ask you about before uh, we start to close it down is where is the, is there anywhere that the dream data product is headed? Are there any changes going forward? Um, any, any new features or things that, you know, that we should know about? Um, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Um, so we're moving, uh, we want, so, so far we've been pushing our, uh, attribution product really hard, uh, which I think is, I would have killed to have that product in my, my old company, but it's all of that is actually built upon our data model. And we're now taking more and more steps towards, uh, making the data model available for for our customers to, to use wherever they they see fit so i can give you a couple of examples of that um so dream the dream that the data model basically holds every touch that you have with accounts anywhere so for example with a reverse etl tool you can build a retargeting audience uh, on facebook or linkedin because here's all the emails that uh your company is dealing with, not just your CRM or your uh, CS platform, no, all emails. And then you can use that to build uh, targeted audiences with saying, because the data is also enriched in the data model, you can say, I only want to show this to like 50 to 200 people. And then you can go do that. It could also be feeding uh, ad platforms information about which of the uh, which of the clicks actually went very far down your, your pipeline. So instead of optimizing on the click to your website, we can actually optimize towards something that becomes sales qualified leads or even one leads if there's enough velocity uh, in that. Um, so we we basically, we've added now a, a destinations. Uh, so we used to just have sources and you connect the data. Now we have destinations as well. So you can begin to connect the uh, reverse ETL tool so you can connect BI tools and so forth. And we're just gonna be making uh, more and more um, yeah, destinations available. So I guess the pitch would be let, let Dream Data take care of all the annoying parts of data wrangling and cleaning the data. And then you can just use that to, to activate the data when it's ready. Got it, very cool. And where should people go to learn more about you and to learn about uh, Dream Data and what you all are up to. So yeah, dreamdata.io, and then uh, yeah, you, they can check out me on on LinkedIn. I'm trying to make a habit of posting multiple times every week now on LinkedIn about stuff we learn and stuff we find interesting. So there's a big stream of, uh, of thoughts coming out there. Awesome. Well, Stefan, thanks again. I really appreciate you spending some time with us today. And uh, it was great having you on Product Led Revenue. Thank you so much, Breezy. And people can just reach out to me afterwards if there's things they want elaborated and so forth. I will be happy to share our experiences, uh, both the good and the bad ones. So, yeah, thanks for the invite. Awesome. All right. Thanks. Thanks for checking out this episode of Product-Led Revenue. This show is brought to you by Correlator, the first platform built for product-led revenue. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow the Product-Led Revenue podcast wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit getcorrelated.com slash podcast to get access to all of the latest episodes.